two confirmed survivors. Son, this is not training. This is a class one quarantined planet. The threats we will be facing are real. Everything on this planet has evolved to kill humans. Every single decision we make will be life or death. But if we are going to survive this, you must realize that fear is not real. Thoughts you create. Now do not misunderstand me. Danger is very real. But fear is a choice. Do you know where we are? No, sir. You've just had a first look at After Earth. I'm looking forward to seeing this film. It seems as though Will Smith does some of his best work when he's working with his children. If you think of films like I Am Legend or Pursuit of Happiness, I think the fact that he's in such a perilous situation with a now older Jaden is going to bring out a spectacular performance in him and his son. After Earth hits theaters June 7th. Now, they say the first is the worst, second is the best, Third is the one with the polka dot dress. I don't know about the dress, but this is the second episode of Picture Lock, and it promises to be a good one. I'll review 42, the new Jackie Robinson biopic. Talk to film enthusiast Bill Calder about a crazy widescreen process called Cinerama. And interview local filmmaker Mary Ratliff about her new film, Good Game. And DC's April filmmaker of the month, Yi Chen, about her new documentary, Chinatown. All ahead on Picture Lock. My first memory of reporting on a historical figure was of Jackie Robinson. I still have the oversized jersey I wore that day. So was 42 as good as my elementary school report? My review of 42 right now. The excessive use of the N-word in Django Unchained may have been a blend of reality and Tarantino's own desire to overuse the word, but it's used as it should be in this film. Although a 128 minute running time could never cover the totality of everything the real Jackie Robinson endured, one of the most powerful scenes in the film is when Philadelphia Phillies manager, played by Alan Tudyk, uses everything in the racial slur handbook against Robinson. The scene is uncomfortable, but authentic, and Chadwick Boseman, who plays Robinson, does a great job of showing the weight of racial prejudice and restraint that many African-American pioneers had to possess in order to successfully open doors for others during those times. Ultimately, drawing back on a quote from Harrison Ford's Branch Rickey, the movie gives its audience the reason number 42 should be respected. People aren't gonna like this. They're gonna do anything to get you to react. Echo a curse with a curse, and they'll, they'll hear only yours. Follow a blow with a blow, and they'll say, the Negro lost his temper. Your enemy will be out in force, and you cannot meet him on his own low ground. We win with hitting, running, fielding, only that. We win if the world is convinced of two things, 
that you are a fine gentleman and a great baseball player. The film is a bit on the nose and molded in a classic biopic fashion, but it's not Disney-fied. The authenticity comes from its main character's ability to go beyond the script and give natural performances. Bozeman's infectious smile and embodiment of the spirit of Robinson makes him an actor to watch. Nicole Bihari gives Rachel Robinson's life as our hero's biggest supporter more than just the typical wife character, but gives her story the respect it deserves as well. Promise me you'll write. When have I ever not written? I want you to know I'm there for you, even if it's words on paper. Ray, in my heart. <laughs> You're getting close now, and the closer you get, the worse they'll be. Don't let them get to you. I won't. God built me to last. I enjoyed the film, and so did the audience I saw it with. Writer-director Brian Hegeland delivers a solid film that's worth the price of admission. I give it a B. You can check out the full review at PictureLockShow.com. 42 in theaters now. Film lovers and critics are made, not born. You don't come into the world knowing all there is to know about film. Over time, you grow up watching movies. And even though you don't know why you like it, you just do. Eventually, your interest turns into love and you start studying not just films that are current, but films and mediums of the past. Being here in the studio, I have the fortune of meeting members and producers who come through, and my next guest loves not just films, but the medium in which they have been recorded as well. Bill Calder, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> no problem. So for weeks now, you've been coming into my office and talking about this thing called Cinerama. Please explain, what is Cinerama? Well, first, thank you for having me. Of course. Um, Cinerama is, was the original Cinerama came out of the Second World War, out of a Weller Waller gunner training system, hmm. and it had 11 16 millimeter films running at the same time in sync. 11? Yes. Wow. <laughs> to train gunnery, gunnery, uh, gunners okay. in the planes. After all that was over, people liked what they had seen, what they had done. Well, right. Can we do it another way? Instead of 11, we came down to three, which photographs what your human eyeball sees. And you and I did this in the office. Can we do it again? Let's do it again. <laughs> I'm looking at your nose. Uh huh. Put your fingers up. Look at you. all I'm interested in is your face. Mm -hmm. And if you go out like that till you can't see your fingers anymore, that is Cinerama. It sees the way your eyeball sees. There was a time when motion pictures looked like this. Then, an enterprising entrepreneur came along. Lowell Thomas speaking. You are about to see the first public exhibition of an entirely new form of entertainment. We call it Cinerama. And one September evening in 1952, the screen opened wide and thrilled audiences with this. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Cinerama. <laughs> The camera had three 27 millimeter lenses. It was three 35 millimeter films running vertically. Um, and there were no zoom lenses. The shot that we just played with here, right. that is the only shot. Wow. It sees the way your eye sees. It is the first widescreen film. It is also the first stereo film. It was the first film shown to the public on mag tracks, magnetic films before cassettes, before reel-to-reels, even before stereo LPs. Hmm. Um, and uh, the first film is called This Is Cinerama, and it is nothing but a f demonstration of a film system. There is no plot. <laughs> uh, it has been restored in LA. I did not go to the 60th anniversary this past September. I read what I can find. I can only admire the people who did all that work hmm. 
because they believed in what we just did with our little fingers there. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and um, Dwight Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, went to the Warner Theater, and we're in Washington, D.C. I come from Pittsburgh, which also had a Warner Cinerama Theater. Mm. That's where I went. Okay. Anyway, President Eisenhower was invited to see Cinerama at the Warner, and he went. And there are reports, more than one, that he grabbed his handkerchief and wiped his eye. <laughs> wow. Now, having said that, there was a group of date people in Dayton, Ohio, in the mid and late 1990s. And I hopped a plane, and I went to Dayton, Ohio, to see, this is Cinerama. And you're a tough man, and I'm a tough guy. But I cried. <laughs> and it's a G-rated film. There's nothing in it for any ethnic, any bad language, anything. It's, um, but it will catch your emotions. Wow. It is so huge. And this, it was seven channels of mag track sound. Uh, wait, no wait, real quick. So a film with no plot. Yes. It's just showing the medium. Yeah, that's correct. Yet it will get a little, as my favorite uh, podcast says, a little dusty in the theater watching Cinerama. If that's your term, I'm fine. Yes. <laughs> yes. You, you get a little emotional. Yes, you do. Wow. You get emotional about it. Um, it. I think Hollywood didn't like Cinerama because it came out of a tennis court in Long Island uh, rather than L.A. Mm. Cinemascope and Panavision came from L.A. And they are lesser systems. They do not at all match Cinerama in any way. So, obviously, uh, Cinerama It is an experience. Is let's put it that way. Yeah, so it, it's near and dear to your heart. So what was one of your first memories or the first film that you actually saw? And then maybe what are some, some of your favorite Cinerama films? Well, there were only five made, and now I'm in trouble because I can't probably remember all five. The first one was This is Cinerama. Mm -hmm. The second was um, Cinerama Holiday, which was a travelogue. I think the third was uh, Seven Wonders... Seven Wonders of the World. There was also called a Cinerama South Seas Adventure, where they went to the Pacific Ocean and that environment. I have never seen the film. And the other one I am aware of is Search for Paradise. Um, it was the aerial shots where a guy named Paul Mance, and since we're talking early 1950s, he had a B-25 bomber from the Second World War where they took the front gun, the nose gun, out of the plane and put the camera there. Wow. And flew it. Um, and that is, uh, there's a lot of that. And the people that worked on those things are very proud of what they did. Uh, nothing else is quite around. You can mention this and that and so forth. So, but, so for a somewhat, mm -hmm. somewhat young spring chicken like myself. Sure. And, uh, wiser man like yourself. Uh, would you say that um, IMAX might be, uh, you know, the comparison for what Cinerama was um, during your time for, you know, my, uh, this generation? No, it is not the comparison. Not even close. Nothing compares to that. I just love how you're so <laughs> passionate about it. That's the answer. <laughs> the answer, Kevin, <laughs> is no. <laughs> My man, Bill. Bill, thank you so much <laughs> for coming on the show. Nothing, ever, Nothing's like that. But thank you for having me. Thanks for the chance to chat. Definitely. So uh, really quick, is there anywhere now do you know that we could actually catch a Cinerama film? I'll, no place on the East Coast. Okay. There, there is a Cinerama film in theater, theater in Seattle, Washington. I've never been to the Seattle area at all. The other is a Cinerama Dome in Los Angeles, and I've never been to Los Angeles. There is nothing on the East Coast. Okay, man. And we're taping in Washington. Well, it seems like I need to get a plane ticket. Can um, I come too? <laughs> <laughs> you, yes. You ask, Pat. <laughs> you ask. Yes, please. Maybe one of our listeners will sponsor for us both to go to L.A. And, or Seattle. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, <laughs> well, Bill, again, thank you so much thank for coming. Thank you very much. <laughs> again, I really do appreciate the fact that um, you have informed me of things that I didn't know existed right. in terms of Cinerama. And I do think it is very important um, in terms of documenting uh, film, film history, the That's medium. Um, so thanks again. You're most welcome. Thank you.
We've reached the segment in our show in which I sit down with a local filmmaker to the DMV area and chat about their latest film and hopefully get an in-depth insight as to the process of filmmaking from their point of view. My first guest, Mary Ratliff, is a native Virginian and an active member of the DC film community. She has worked on several features, a web series, commercials, and numerous short films as a member of the art department and a script supervisor. Yet it's her screenwriting that has placed her as a final in 2010's DC short screenwriting competition for her script, Catching Up. The film also received the Panavision New Filmmaker Grant, and the completed short won the Visions Award for Outstanding Thesis Project in 2010 at American University. Now, she's working on her first feature-length documentary, Good Game. Mary, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Of course. Uh, before we get into Good Game, I always like to start at the beginnings. Um, so, how did you get in the film? Um, well, you can sort of go back all the way to when I was two years old, and E.T. came out. E.T. And my mom took me to see it, and it's actually my earliest memory, is sitting there in the theater, watching this on the big screen, being completely entranced. Like, I was obsessed. I had the t-shirts, I had the dolls, I had everything. Reese's Pieces? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was the whole nine yards. And so I made my mom take me to go see it, like, every weekend. I think I saw it, like, 12 or 13 times in the theater. Wow. Are you and, serious? Yeah. I was obsessed. And <laughs> so <Wow>. um, <laughs> that was really, like... It sort of started me on a lifetime of film appreciation. And um, what's interesting to me is uh, Jurassic Park just came out last weekend, right. IMAX 3D. And I went to see it because Jurassic Park was actually, I was 13 when it came out. And that was when I realized the same director had also done E.T. And it sort of opened me up to this whole behind the scenes, like there was a guy that was responsible for this. It wasn't just a thing that happened. Right. And um, so that was really interesting to go back and see that on the big screen again and, and kind of relive that that 13 year old me because same story. I had the T-shirts. I had the, the student planner and the notebooks, like <laughs> pencil box, everything. Wow. So <laughs> that's kind of funny. It's like every uh, film enthusiast, filmmaker, like has that one film that they remember. I have a friend also that Jurassic Park was like that for him, and he saw it like 10 times. And I was, I, I tweeted him the other day, and I was like, man, I just wish I was like in the theater with you, because I knew he was, he, he had the tickets long ago to yeah. see, you know, the screening for uh, Jurassic Park. So that's amazing. So a, a lot of people might not know, we, we went to uh, American yep. University together. We both got our MFA from there. Um, and while you were there, you actually made Catching Up. So mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit about Catching Up? Uh, catching up is actually something that I, I took a class because part of the MFA uh, requirements are you have to take sort of an interdisciplinary class. And I took a class as, uh, it was a criminal justice class actually because my dad was a police officer um, when I was growing up. So it was just something that's always interested me. And I wrote this script for the final of that class because the, I, the assignment was to sort of write some sort of fiction piece based on what we had been learning. And being a screenwriter, I wrote a screenplay, and then I, I got done with it, and I just sort of shelved it for a little while. I didn't even think about it. And I was at a, a conference and talking to people about being six years old and going to visit my dad at work meant going to the jail and mm -hmm. hanging out with criminals and, like, eating food in a prison, you know. <laughs> and to me, that was it was no big deal. It was just sort of part of my life. And they were like, that's amazing. That's a really odd visual. Right. And I thought, well, I've actually already written that script. And so I sort of brought it back out and looked at it and decided to do that as my thesis film. And um, I ended up actually filming it in the jail where my dad worked. Oh, wow. And uh, a lot of odd coincidences. Um, the gentleman that played uh, the role that was inspired by my father, Bo Keister, his dad was actually the magistrate while my dad was a sergeant. So they knew each other. They were friends. And then we have a cameo from a deputy who is actually a, a working deputy. His dad was the sheriff while my dad was there. <laughs> and so it was wow. like this big reunion. Yeah, right, so you're catching up on the set of Catching Up. Yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> and uh, the whole script actually, um, a lot of people are surprised by it, but um, pretty much everything in the script actually happened, not necessarily like to one inmate or at one time, but right. um, part of the, the point of the script is that, you know, the sergeant's daughter gets broken down on the side of the road and a former inmate picks her up. And that happened to my sister. Wow. Um, her car broke down, and the guy that stopped to help her, this is pre-cell phone days, um, the guy that stopped to help her was actually somebody that had been at the jail with my dad and gave her a ride home. Wow. I'm sure it was very awkward. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did, did, he, did she recognize her? Or, you know, he person? recognized her eventually because uh, it's, I grew up in a very small town in okay. southwestern Virginia. Right. Um, it's Pulaski, Virginia, uh, really close to Blacksburg and Radford, if people know those places. And... Uh, 
So, you know, as soon as you tell somebody where you live or your last name, they're like, oh, are you related to so-and-so? And then it turns out that, like, their grandmother's brother went to elementary school with their uncle's friend, you know. It just, right. So it was, uh, you know, that kind of thing. But okay. And that all sort of folded into the film. And, you know, we shot it, like I said, on location in Pulaski because there is, in my mind, no town that can stand in for, for my hometown. So. Right. Right. And you shot, uh, it was 16 millimeter, yep. right? Okay, so what what uh, did you learn from your experiment experience in shooting sixteen mil? I mean, you know that it, nowadays in the you know digital medium that we use, you know, actually shooting on film and cutting. Uh, you probably didn't cut on film, but you know, no. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We definitely did shoot that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but how, what was that? What was that experience like? Um, it was fascinating because I actually, other than uh, the Bolex project that was in the Production 2 class that we first had together, um, mm -hmm. I had never worked with film before. I do have an undergraduate degree and in, in technically it's on paper, it says film, but we only worked in video there. And so it was partially just I really wanted to, to work with this because I hadn't done it. And I feel like you kind of have to do things the hard way mm. before you earn the easy way. Right. And um, so, and I wanted a particular look. I wanted that grainy old memories, like old photo album look that film gives you. Um, the trick is that since we made that film, the digital revolution has brought it up to the point where you can get that look digitally. Right. So um, really shooting on 16 now is you've got to make it like a very distinct artistic choice and it's a very expensive artistic choice. Right. <laughs> so, Don't mess that exposure up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And there's so much, like, we we didn't run out of film, but it started to look like we might towards the end. And you, you get so used to when you're shooting on video to just be like, you know, oh, let's just do a series mm. or let's let's just do 30 takes right. and let's just, let's just shoot that cool-looking thing because <laughs> it's interesting. And so you have to get yourself out of that mindset. You've got to stop giving things so many heads and tails. But then you get to the editing process and you have so little to work with. Mm. And so there's, I remember there was one scene that just we cut two frames before we should have. And it was, you know, it was, I just want to hold that look just that little bit longer, but it just it literally did not exist. Mm. So we couldn't do it. Wow. And so a lot more pre-production. If I ever did it again, which I probably would not, <laughs> now that I've, I've done it, so I can say I've done it. Right. But, um, yeah, pre-production storyboards. I didn't do any storyboards, which is bad, terrible. Don't do that. <laughs> so... <laughs> Yeah, so you got yeah, a lot to learn. Uh, well, cool. Um, let's take a look at the trailer for Good Game and then get into that. Okay. And it's not a good game. It's not good oh, That is a big one to throw. Jason's going to be good. EG Machine, I'm 23 years old, and I'm a professional StarCraft II player. Hey, oh my god. Wow, people actually can play video games for money? Like, competitive computer games? Like, that was just surreal to me. I remember being like, wow, I've won myself a TV, now I'm a professional gamer. It's kind of like moments like that, you start to realize that you're basing your life around a game. If it's sustainable, if we can keep this going, esports is going to be absolutely huge. They all feel a sense of pressure because they do have this amazing training facility and they are practicing so extensively that now they really have to get results. I'm not coming here to be a, a top 10, a top uh, you know, 16 player. I, I'm coming here to win. Okay, Mary, so I'm no gamer, <laughs> but uh, that looks like a very interesting uh, doc. So can you give us a summary of what the film is about? So basically what we did was we followed a team of, uh, at the time, we started out with seven guys, then there were nine, now there's less. Um, but it was, they are professional StarCraft II players. So they earn a salary for playing this game competitively. Uh, they go to tournaments, they earn prize money if they win. Um, 
and that's their life. That's their job. Uh, you know, sort of 24-7, they spend 8 to 10 hours a day practicing, sometimes up to 12 and 14. Wow. Um, this particular team actually all lives in a house together, or most of them live in a house together, um, and they practice together and everything. So, And this team, um, it's the, the team is Evil Geniuses, and one of the things that they're known for is sort of being the most heavily sponsored team. So they're mm. the ones that have kind of the business savvy. Um, they have a lot of deals. They do commercials and wow. things like that, and they have, you know, the logos on their t-shirts. They're, they're a lot like what you know of standard uh, traditional athletes. Uh, it's just they happen to do their, their game sitting in a booth on a stage. Right. So. That is so awesome. So um, parents out there, um, if you're listening, <laughs> uh, your child can actually make money gaming. So mom and dad, when I used to play Sega Genesis, you know, maybe there could have been a documentary about me. I don't know. Maybe not. But uh, that's that's awesome. So um, what inspired you to make the film? I know that, um, you know, you're into gaming as well. What, what inspired the film? Um, I've been playing StarCraft 1. Um, there, it's actually the game that we feature is the sequel, so it's StarCraft II. Uh, but I played StarCraft One starting in 2000, um, and it was sort of a really important part of my life back then um, for various and sundry reasons. Um, and so it was a game I loved, and it was a game that had a really strong story. And story is the most important thing in the world to me. Like it's mm. it's what I look for in everything that I enjoy. And so then when they released the sequel, I started paying attention to this eSports world because I'm not a traditional sports person. Like, I don't really go to football games or baseball games. Like, I don't, I don't know most of the rules. I don't know how it works. <laughs> right. And so I started seeing this, these similarities to this world that I didn't understand of people that, that love these traditional sports and seeing this world that I did understand and so I kind of wanted to really get into that. Um, what sort of caught me the most was I was actually at a bar for, it was, um, I want to say it was the U.S. versus Algeria in the World Cup okay. when Landon Donovan got that, like, last-second goal. And it was a bar in a mall, and the entire mall erupted in cheers. <laughs> and it was just this great electric moment. Because I do watch World Cup soccer. That's, like, the only game I understand. Okay. And um, then I went to an MLG event because they had one in D.C. and it felt the same. And I was like, wow, this is this is really similar. These people are sports fans. Right. Um, so I just I really wanted to, to start getting into that and exploring it. And that idea of like, you know, this is sort of a, a different way to get into that American dream of of doing what you love for a living. So. Mm. So uh, obviously you are a screenwriter. Mm -hmm. um, and when it comes to documentaries, there is an element of actually you know, writing. So outlining um, so that you know what you're going to shoot and how you want the story to go. So um, what, what's your process? What was your process um, in terms of outlining and writing? Um, I think the process with Good Game was probably a, a lesson in everything that could go wrong did. Um, <laughs> mostly because when we actually first started, Evil Geniuses was on a, a very particular path, um, and then they completely swerved and mm. changed what they were doing, and then they swerved again, and then they would add players and, and get rid of them. And so every time I sort of sat and wrote down, like, this is what I want the movie to kind of be like, they would announce, oh, we've completely changed everything we're doing. <laughs> wow. And so it was very much, it was a, we filmed for about a year, a little over a year. And so it was a year of just shifting gears constantly. And then once we finally said, okay, that's a wrap, we're not going to shoot anymore. Because you could shoot forever on almost any documentary and just be like, oh, there's this, this one more thing we have to get. There's <laughs> right. one more thing. Right. And uh, so finally we just declared, okay, that's it. We're, not, we're never going to get post done if we don't stop. Mm. Um, and so at that point I sat and I wrote an outline and a, sort of a more formal script. Um, and then recently the, we have a new editor that came on in December. Um, he took that outline, he looked at it, and he said, you know, I'll keep parts of it. And he kind of chucked most of it out the window. Um, and he wow. rewrote an outline from his point of view, which was really, it showed me a lot because I saw what parts of it he felt were working and what parts he wanted to sort of beef up and everything. Mm -hmm. And so now it's become a collaborative process between the two of us, sort mm -hmm. of writing as we edit. Um, and in between the first rough cut and the second one, which he just sent me, we've actually completely changed the skeleton and the structure of the film. Wow. So... Uh, a lot of the pieces are still there. They're just in different orders, and we're kind of playing up different parts. So Okay. So being able to adapt, right? Right. That's a big part of it. So um, what part of the process are, are you in in terms of making the film, and then how can people get involved? Well, we're in the post-production process now. 
Um, things got a little delayed. 2012 was, was not a good year in general. Um, but so we're, I've gotten a rough cut of the completed film and then now we're on a second cut of the first half, which I just got from the editor a day or two ago. Um, and so I'll be getting him notes and we're sort of going back and forth on that. We have a composer who's already working, um, Rob Rusley. He's doing a really great job. And so we're already getting the music laid in and, and things like that. And um, if people want to get involved, there's all kinds of ways to keep up with what we're doing. We're on Twitter at Nine Hour Films, um, all spelled out, all one word. I usually use hashtag DG Movie, but um, I was just, <laughs> it gets hijacked a little bit by people from other fandoms. Um, <laughs> But then we're also on Facebook. Um, but the easiest way to find everything all in one place is our website, which is goodgamemovie.com. And that also, we have a, a section specifically that's how to help. Okay. Um, and post-production is one of the most expensive parts of the process. Definitely. And a lot of people don't realize, you know, they think, oh, you're just sitting in front of your computer, like throwing stuff together. It's <laughs> right. so easy. Um, and not so much because you have to get somebody to make graphics for you and you have to have a composer and, you know, somebody to do the color correction to make it all look pretty. and and all of that stuff. So it's it's kind of expensive. So if people want to help out, we do have some Kickstarter style perks. It's not a Kickstarter campaign as such, but um, we've got some great like stickers and things that you can get from us. So okay, you know. Well, cool, Mary. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, I can't for wait to me. see Good Game. <laughs> oh, man, I wish I kept playing PlayStation when I was a kid. You know, <laughs> but thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you. Again, welcome to the second episode of Picture Lock, where we focus on film. My next guest is an emerging filmmaker living in the District of Columbia's Chevy Chase neighborhood. She has won two peer awards as well as a Best Narrative Short Award at the 2010 Our City Film Festival for her narrative short FL324. The success of the film led to the creation of a boutique production company in 2008 where Chen produced and directed her second independent project, Chinatown, a half-hour verite documentary about one of the district's oldest ethnic communities. The film's intimate observation of the residents sheds light on the intricate cultural and social issues facing the gentrified neighborhood. Yi, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. <laughs> of course. Now, first off, we have to give congratulations <coughs> for uh, April 2013, this month. Um, you are DC Filmmaker <laughs> of the Month. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. Yeah, it is. It really is. I'm really, really grateful for that. Um, and DC Film Office honors a local filmmaker every month, so which is a really good, great initiative to um, recognize the local filmmakers. And, um, and I'm really happy that more people are um, getting to know uh, the film Chinatown, and, mm -hmm. um, and more people are seeing it. Um, and so that's that's really making me really happy too. Sweet. So uh, before we actually get into Chinatown, um, I always like to start at the beginning. So you actually grew up in China and you received your bachelor's degree at from Fudan University in Shanghai, right? That's correct. Um, and so how did you get over to the States and then how did you get into film? Uh, so I actually came here um, t for graduate school and um, I was um, I first went to University of Wisconsin Madison. Um, I was in the. It's a long story. Do you want me to tell you the story? <laughs> <laughs> Give us the abbreviated okay. version. <laughs> it's, okay, so I was actually initially not coming here to study film. I was. Uh, I came here to study linguistics, uh, PhD program. Um, but I've always. Um, liked watching films um, and in college I wrote film reviews for college newspaper uh -huh. and um, that was my favorite thing to do is watching was watching films so uh, when I was studying um, I like I really like linguistics um, but I realized that I had a bigger passion for film and because I was um, sitting in film classes at the university um, and just totally fell in love with it. So I applied to film schools. I got my master from um, University of Wisconsin-Madison and applied for film programs and wow. I decided to give it a try and see if I would like it and whether I would be good at it. So that's how I came to American University. Okay, great. Wow. So, uh, so again, that's, that's 
whole story. <laughs> <laughs> no, that wasn't too long. That was that was good. So okay, so it's uh, I just love hearing uh, the backstory for filmmakers. But um, so from there in at AU, you actually filmed FL three twenty four, um, and you shot it on sixteen millimeter, correct? And That's it's correct. about ten minutes. So can you talk a little bit about um, the film and what inspired the film? Um, so. I really love um, Chinese American director An Lee's film, and um, this film was inspired by his um, wedding banquet and also um, a Japanese director Ozu's Tokyo Story. So, um, inspired by both films, I wanted to do something that um, explore the um, issues because um, the story is about um, a an Asian artist, uh, he um, is gay and his father, uh, very traditionally father, is coming to visit him and um, his father doesn't know um, that he has a boyfriend that living with him and mm -hmm. he also has some issues with his father. Um, they hadn't seen each other for about seven years so this was really the first time they kind of um, lived together after um, a long period of time that they weren't really talking to each other. So um, I wanted to explore um, the, the topic that, you know, not, it's not really discussed too much in, in mainstream media in the United States. And um, I also love black and white films. So that's why I chose um, black and white film to, um, to uh, as versus color to do that film. Okay, cool. Yeah, uh, it's definitely, um from what I've seen, it is uh, a beautiful, beautifully shot. It's kind of like a, a, a love story in a sense. I think that the 16 millimeter format, and uh, Mary was just on, she was kind of talking about it, but it does give that uh, kind of love story, romantic feel to any kind of film because of the throwback, mm -hmm. gritty look that it gives. Exactly. <laughs> no, it was really amazing to work with films. I absolutely love working with film. It's um, the process is so different from working with videos. and. Um, so I was really glad I had the chance to do that while I was at AU. Yeah. Okay, so um, obviously Chinatown, let's uh, get into the trailer and then we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. My name is Jiating. I've been in DC for 17 years. In 15 years, the population is only 目前的中国城没有一家华裔宿舍店像自由市场一样的那种菜场大家都好啊都好啊 Other than senior citizens, you really don't see Chinese families, Chinese people conducting everyday life in China. Even though the Chinatown community is shrinking, we're just trying to hold on to whatever little bit that we have. Well, I think the importance in having ethnic communities like Chinatown and the city is to show where we came from. Well, knowing that Chinatown is shrinking and one day it may not exist as the way we know it now. Yee, the documentary looks amazing. Um, obviously, if Chinatown does dissolve, that is a part of DC's heritage. So what inspired you to make the film? Um, so I had the idea to make a documentary about Chinatown in D.C. in about, um, it was in 2011. Um, one is that um, I've always been interested in um, Chinese American history. And second is um, 
that I love visiting Chinatown myself. Um, almost every major city I've been to in the United States, I've visited the Chinatowns there. Um, I love I love Chinese food, and <laughs> that's a place that you can find um, in most cities authentic Chinese food, and ah. um, and it just. Um, there is there is an emotional connection that um, something about Chinatown that I just really love visiting when I go to different places. So um, and um, so those are the two main reasons. And I was really curious um, because um, when you walk on the street of Chinatown in D.C., you don't really see as many um, Chinese um, immigrants mm. as you know as if you were in New York City or San Francisco. It right. feels very different. So I was curious um, who actually lived in Chinatown and also what their lives are like. Right. So a as you delved into the documentary, a part of it is, you know, um, coming out with an outline. And uh, I'm sure as you investigated the story, you had to also construct the story for your viewer. So in terms yeah. of outlining and preparation, pre-production, um, like what did you do to prepare? Sure. Um, so um, I started researching. I read a lot of um, almost every single book I could fi find that or talks about Chinatown. Um, and um, I also watched um, several documentaries um, about Chinatown. Um, one, but none of those are actually about DC Chinatown. There's one uh, PBS one about San Francisco Chinatown, um, and another one about New York Chinatown but so what I did was I read a lot of books I uh, watched a lot of um, films and also um, started collecting um, newspapers um, and I got really lucky because um, halfway through my research in the summer of 2011 um, I read an article on Washington Post uh, it was about the Wallach House in Chinatown um, so um, I immediately fell in love with that story, and I knew that um, the the few ca the few people that were profiled in the article would make really good characters, and they have really good stories. Um, so I contacted the journalist, and uh, he put me in touch with the Tenants Association at the Wallach House, and that's how I. Um, uh, got to meet them for the first time in, um, I think it was fall 2011. Um, and we had an immediate connection because mm -hmm. uh, one of the character uh, in the film, she's also from Shanghai. Okay. Um, so I asked them, I told them what I had in mind and um, asked them if they would let me um, film them. So that's how the project got started. Wow, that's awesome. Um, so uh, what do you fear will happen if Chinatown does dissolve? Um, so right now, um, the, Chinese, the ethnic Chinese population in Chinatown is around 400. Mm. And the Wallach House is a, a subsidized housing um, in Chinatown on 6 and H Street. Um, so about 245 residents live in Chinatown. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, about 245 residents live in Wallach House. Okay. So, um, and that's more than half of the the 400 population. And um, um, so, for me, um, and and also that Verizon Center is is getting nine new digital billboards this summer. Um, so Chinatown is continuing developing, and you if you go around the neighborhood. Actually, I was shooting some B-rolls um, on a Sunday morning one, one day, and um, I was driving around, and I was really surprised to see how many constructions are actually going on around Chinatown. Mm -hmm. um, new condos, um, there's DC City Center. Um, so the real estate price is, is not going to, it's, it's probably going to go keep going up. Um, and that's what drove out a lot of Chinese small businesses and residents um, in the 70s and 80s. Mm. Um, so in the 70s, um, the city started um, planning for the convention center and then the metro, um, then there was a metro stop, came, the metro stop came in and then the gallery place um, and then Verizon Center. So all of those developments um, drove up the real estate price and small businesses and 
uh, Chinese residents, they, they, they can't afford the, um, the, the rent anymore and they move to suburbs. So mm. it's continuing happening in Chinatown. Um, so uh, for me, uh, what, makes a, uh, what makes Chinatown Chinatown is it's, it's, it's people. If, if you don't have Chinese, um, ethnic Chinese immigrants living in the neighborhood, um, then it, you know, it, it has the archway, but that probably would be the, la you know, the only right. thing that's kind of remaining there. And, um, and then if you ask tourists who come to Chinatown in D.C., um, and, and if, as a tourist, if you go to New York City to visit Chinatown, what are you looking for? Like, what do you want to see in Chinatown? Are you getting those in D.C. Chinatown? Um, so for me, like, um, I am concerned about the losing of po population. Mm -hmm. And um, the good thing is that Wallach House will continue to be there. Okay. Um, so at least those residents could li can live in Chinatown. Um, so for me, um, what I'm hoping for Chinatown, which I don't know how likely it's going to happen, is mm -hmm. affordable housing should be the number one issue um, to um, get more residents to live in Chinatown. Also, for if the city could provide certain incentives for Chinese businesses um, to have a presence there, that would be something also helping um, Chinatown to maintain its you know it's authenticity right wow so uh, i mean that's it's, it's it's what i love about documentary um, a, lo a lot of times is that um it educates you in a way that it's Absolutely. entertaining but also it's something that i would never think about you know like i go to dc all the time and i oh i'm in chinatown let me get something to eat but you never think about the people that are actually there right. so that's incredible um what do you think of chinatown <laughs> I think it's a nice place to go visit, and uh, we always get, um, what is it, Dim Sun? I forget what the name of the one restaurant that we go to, but we love it. Um, I guess we don't love it that much if I didn't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but no, that, I mean, it's really interesting. So what part of the process are you in um, with the film, and then how can people get involved? Because I'm sure, like yeah. me, like if I don't know, if you're ignorant to it, then, you know, but want, now that you have the film out and people can actually see it, and how can people get involved? Um, sure, that's a really good question. So um, the film actually screened at our City Film Festival on March 10th, um, and there's another screening coming up at American University on Tuesday, April 23rd. Um, and with this film, um, my goal is to, um, because what got me interested in this is this is something that um, is not discussed in the mainstream media um, you don't see that story a lot. And then um, the film is told from the perspective of the residents. So the three characters in the film, um, they've lived in Chinatown for decades. Um, so I, I would like the film to reach more audience mm -hmm. um, so more people are aware of um, the just the story from the resident's perspective because we don't really see those we don't really hear those stories um, and um, I'm submitting the film to film festivals um, I'm working with um, nonprofit organizations to put up screenings um, community screenings are really really important for this film um, because um, it's a community issue right and um, every screening we have a panel discussion afterwards to talk about the different issues um, including language access including affordable housing and um, other issues as well so um, if audience want to get involved uh, we would love people to help organize screenings in their communities um, we also um, have a Facebook page we have 400 20 likes now <laughs> nice. so um, so the more people know about it um, it will have a, you know a, a, a more positive impact on the future of Chinatown right. so um, the well, what's the what's the web website that for it um, do you have a website for the film I do have a website it's a tumblr um, website um, it's chinatowndc.tumblr.com okay and the link to twitter facebook is all on that website um so just the facebook page is chinatown project so if you search chinatown project you'll find it okay 
Well, Yi, that's all the time we have for right now. But, oh, man, thank you so much for coming on the show and making us aware of um, what's going on in Chinatown. Thank you for having me. That's all for this week, folks. I'd like to thank my guest, Bill Calder, for keeping Cinerama alive in our hearts, as well as Nine Hour Films, Mary Ratliff, and DC's Filmmaker of the Month of April 2013, Yi Chen, for coming on the show. You can check them out at ninehourfilms.com and chinatowndc.tumblr.com, respectively. Don't forget to drop us a line at picturelockshow at gmail.com and check out the show website, picturelockshow.com. And if you're feeling extra frisky, tweet us at at picturelockshow. Until next time, I hope you stay locked on film. <laughs>